Okay, so um, for those who joined a bit later, I am Jia Yi from Medical Channel Asia, your MC for tonight. So in this next segment, we have set aside some time for Dr. Julian to answer some questions that were posed by some of you during the registration process. So let's start with the first question for tonight. What is of a higher cardiac risk, taking the vaccine or contracting the virus since there are reports of cardiac issues from both? Dr. Julian? So yeah, so to answer that question, I've, I've since uh, the vaccines have been rolled out, I've had many patients come to me with the same kind of question. And my same answer is always uh, benefit over risk. Uh, the benefits of you being protected from COVID-19 far outweighs the very minute, small risk of the vaccines. Now, nothing in this world is completely 100% safe. Yeah. Uh, same goes for the vaccines, whether they are the mRNA vaccines or the, the traditional vaccines. Nothing is 100% safe, but uh, in prescribing therapies or treatments as doctors, we uh, always offer treatments that are beneficial for you never treatments that will harm you deliberately. Uh, and so in this uh, scenario of uh, protecting your heart, as I mentioned before, uh, from COVID-19 effects, the vaccines do give you that added protection. Um, yes. Thank you, Dr. Julian. So with your confidence, the confidence given from you, we do know that actually taking the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine is very important and all healthcare professionals definitely have the best of heart uh, for all of us, all their patients. Yeah. So um, the next question that um, one of our attendees have asked um, is DASH diet, one of the best approach or diet managing patients with hypertension? Well, I think I've answered this question uh, briefly just now. Uh, there are many diets in the market now. You see it all from the so-called health coaches. You read on social media, go online, ask Dr. Google, there's this certain diet and diet. But I think a lot of these uh, diets, they may appear uh, good on the surface because, for example, you lose weight. Yeah, for example, the keto diet is low carbs or no carbs. Definitely lose weight. Um, but there's a flip side. Uh, their internal uh, cholesterol levels are actually uh, quite high and that may pose problems in the future in terms of uh, plaque buildup in coronary arteries. So I think to answer this question, generally speaking, I would say uh, if it is harmless, if the diet that you're going to take is harmless, then no harm taking doing it. But my, my advice is still be to stick to a very balanced, uh, moderate kind of diet where you don't actually uh, miss out on any particular uh, food group, uh, uh, but take everything in small, moderate amounts. I think that is the, the easiest as well as the most logical and sensible way of doing it. Yeah, so so I guess the key is really that um, eat everything in moderation, right? So not too much of a certain type of food or not ex totally abstaining as well. So um, let's move on to the next question. This question is from um, someone from Indonesia. So a patient from uh, my hometown at Makassar, Indonesia, went through ECG and echo and the results was normal. So when they went for an angiogram test in Singapore, there was 90% blockage. So how was it possible that the initial results did not show anything and what kind of tests would you recommend? So uh, in terms of cardiac tests, cardiac screening tests, uh, the cheaper it is, the easier it is to perform, the more available it is, the less accurate those tests are. So if you, if you, if you, if you do more expensive tests, more invasive tests, of course, the details will be higher. You'll be able to pick up disease even more. So the ECG and the echoes, those are very inexpensive tests to do, very easy to do, very safe to do, but the accuracy is not the best. Uh, so I think it's always important to check with your cardiologist or the doctor. Uh, the test has been offered and how the doctor sees the patient as a whole, your risk factors, your age, your family history, 
and how the and then the doctor will decide whether any additional more accurate tests are necessary to pick up. Yeah. So in this uh, particular case scenario, perhaps maybe not an angiogram was uh, uh, should be off could could have been offered in the beginning. Maybe a CT scan, for example, a CT coronary angiogram would have picked up the ninety percent blockage, even though your ECG and echo would have been normal. A CT scan is less invasive than an invasive coronary angiogram, and then it might pick up that blockage. So again, have that discussion with your doctor to see which tests uh, are most appropriate. Mm, yes, so I believe um, the attendee would definitely have um, learned that uh, it's important to um, visit their cardiologist to really assess them as a whole, holistically based on their past history as well as their current condition to better recommend which test should they go through. So next question, um, we can move on. It's from a nurse. So from, for this uh, nurse, she never really had um, the need to keep checking her blood pressure and um, never really had any symptoms. However, um, she noticed that um, the BP was 130 to 140 on times when um, this attendee went for the COVID-19 vaccine. So should, um, should he or she be diagnosed and would they need medication? So there's this uh, uh, phenomenon that we see uh, in clinics. We call this white coat hypertension, meaning a doctor in a white coat. So you, you, you come to a clinic setting, you see the doctor, you get a bit nervous. Uh, you may not know that you're anxious, but internally your body is reacting to the stress or the anxiety. And then your blood pressure will actually be, be elevated when you're in the clinic setting. So maybe in this scenario, when you were having the vaccine, you were worried about the side effects or whatever. Uh, and then your blood pressure was elevated. So you might be having quite cold hypertension. Uh, one way of going around this is to do what we call an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, where we, you have a device that you take home, that this device will automatically measure your blood pressure every hour on the dot, regardless of what you're doing, sleeping, exercising, doing at, at work. It will measure the blood pressure, and therefore it gives a very more a more objective uh, uh, measurement of your blood pressure to determine whether or not you have hypertension. Uh, regardless, uh, a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 140, I would think it's not considered high. Uh, for blood pressure, systolic blood pressure less than 140, we would consider that actually normal. Yeah. Mm, okay, thank you for sharing. I believe this um, nurse attendee would... Um, Maybe she was nervous when she went, went for her COVID vaccine. That's why she perhaps could have that white coat hypertension. So um, next question, we'll move on, um, is about a patient with a permanent dual pacemaker implant. So the patient would like to ask, um, what must um, he or she avoid um, as a patient with permanent dual pacemaker implant? So a pacemaker is... Uh, 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 an external, so-called external uh, pacemaker that helps to uh, provide an electrical current to the heart to keep the heart pumping. Uh, again, I, I did not touch on this heart condition uh, in my uh, earlier presentation, but basically patients with, when their own natural or native pacemaker becomes faulty, then you need an external pacemaker to help the heart to pump, to give the electrical uh, current to pump. So this is what we call a permanent a pacemaker. Dual, dual means that the leads go to both the top chamber as well as the bottom chamber. Uh, again, regardless of whether it's dual or single chamber pacemaker, um, nothing really much needs to be avoided when you have a pacemaker. Most of these of the newer pacemakers nowadays are MRI compatible. So in the olden days, all pacemakers, you need to, you can't go for MRI scans because they're afraid that the, the, the magnetic uh, uh, forces will pull out your pacemaker. But now these uh, pacemakers are compatible for MRI, so nothing really needs to be avoided. Uh, of course, um, if you go through the airports, if you do get a chance to travel VTL, yeah, uh, usually the pacemaker company will give you a little card so that you will avoid going through the X-ray uh, uh, machine because you're definitely able to do, 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 and you walk past with the pacemaker. 
Uh, other than that, I think besides, I think a week after your implant, implantation of the pacemaker, usually you try not to move the left arm. But after a while, it's all being healed up. I don't think there's any specific um, restrictions to your, to your activity. Oh, the other thing is uh, handphones. So I suppose most of the time, the battery is placed here on the top left corner of your chest. So perhaps when you use your mobile phone, try to use your right hand instead of your left, because sometimes it might interfere with the uh, workings of the pacemaker, your mobile phone. Uh, other than that, no, no, no other real uh, activities that you, you need to avoid. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jillian. That was very insightful. You really went through all the different um, areas and the sectors of uh, what a patient with um, pacemaker needs to take note of. So um, let's come to the last question of this um, session of the pre-collated Q&A. So this last question is, is palpitation a concern if one was infected by COVID-19? Uh, yes, it is. So uh, I think I just briefly touched on COVID-19 and the heart, but one of the conditions that can occur when you get infected with COVID-19 is this condition called atrial fibrillation, where the heart rhythm of your heart gets a bit haywire and becomes fast, the heartbeat gets fast and irregular. Uh, people with atrial fibrillation will have increased uh, risk of stroke. Yeah, so patients with uh, COVID-19 infections or any, any form of sepsis uh, or infection can predispose you to having atrial fibrillation and therefore um, increased risk of stroke. So yeah, so it is a concern if you get palpitations. Um, uh, but of course, you need to determine what kind of palpitations. Uh, some people with fever, uh, of course, most of us, when we have fever from a, from a COVID-19 infection, for example, your body will mount a, a response to the fever and your heart rate will go up, yeah? But if it is not uh, an irregular, irregular kind of heartbeat, it's just a normal sinus tachycardia, then that's not really of concern. Yeah, that's a normal fever response. But of course, if it becomes irregular and fast, usually in the range of more than 130 or 150 beats per minute, uh, even when you're resting and it's irregular, then that might be atrial fibrillation and you need to get that checked out. Okay, thank you, Dr. Julian, for answering all this, uh, all the questions that our attendees have posted during their registration. I believe um, we have all learned a lot, um, ranging from um, coronary heart diseases, how our arteries can be clogged, and up to the point where um, how COVID-19 actually affects the heart and the COVID-19 vaccine. So right before we head into this first question from an anonymous attendee, so the attendee has asked, what is the recommended frequency to undergo heart tests and check up based on your age? So Dr. Julian, you did share that um, um, from different ages, you recommend them to go for um, both females and males to go for the heart checks, but how frequent do they need to go for it? So I think uh, I mentioned before, uh, men above age of 40, women above age of 50 should at least go for a simple heart health screen not necessarily with a cardiologist, but with a GP to do a simple check of your cholesterol, check your sugar, uh, check your ECG, maybe do a chest X-ray. Yeah, just as a simple basic screen. Uh, but the frequency subsequently depends again on what uh, is found on the initial screen, as well as the risk factors. Uh, the, uh, the usual recommendation is uh, at least a yearly a blood test. Um, if uh, if you require uh, medications for cholesterol or diabetes, for example, then the usual follow-up is recommended maybe every three to four months Yeah, to repeat the blood test at each setting. And then depending again on your risk factors and your risk profile, you might do an ECG every, every six months. Uh, some people do uh, exercise treadmill tests every year or every two years, again, depending on, on what conditions you have. Yeah. 
Mm, okay, so it's really important to um, still regularly visit your cardiologist so they can still better recommend based on the individual's um, profile how frequent they should go for their heart test. So um, next up, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. So are there any medications that can dissolve the fat plug instead of going for operation? So just now, Dr. Julian Tan shared that when the fat plug clogs up, then there's the blood clot and then it will cause the heart attack possibly. So are there any medications that can help with that? So the only known medication to, uh, okay, to answer your question off, there is no such medications, at least in the mainstream uh, medical uh, uh, arena that can completely dissolve plug or fats that has been stuck to your artery wall. Okay. Uh, you might read a lot, a lot about it, uh, see a, a lot on YouTube and uh, Dr. Google, or oh, they got this suction that can suck up the thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, looks very fancy, um, but to date, take it from me, there is no such therapy that can remove the plug completely. The only, the only two main treatments that are available, number one, of course, is the stent uh, to open up the blocked artery, pushing aside the plug. Second treatment, uh, cholesterol medicines or statins. They have been shown uh, both in animal studies as well as in human trials, to reduce the volume of the plug. Yeah, to reduce the volume of this yellow stuff. But again, not completely eradicating them, uh, but it reduces the volume of the plug and therefore reduces your risk for heart attacks. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing, Dr. Gillian. So um, you mentioned that there's no medication. So there's another attendee who asked if um, there are no medications, can the plug be in the heart be reversed naturally? For instance, um, exercise or any other methods that it can be reversed? Um, minimally. I mean, it's not been shown that, if, let's say if you, do, if you run uh, three marathons a year, then the plug would magically disappear. Of course, Exercise and good diets, they have uh, other benefits to the heart. Yeah, it in increases the, 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 the strength of the heart, improves your stamina, and overall, you, you end up leading a very healthy lifestyle. You eat well, you sleep regularly, you have the, those regular exercise. So generally, the exercise and diet, they give you the added benefit. But to completely remove the plug per se, just by doing natural means, Again, you hear you hear a lot about, about a lot of this from so-called health coaches and things like that. Um, yeah, there are one or two anecdotal uh, success stories, so to speak. But I think, generally speaking, uh, no, there's there's no wonder natural treatment for that. Prevention is key. So instead of talking about wanting to remove the plaque why not uh, lead a healthy lifestyle early on so that you don't get a lot of plug built up and then you don't have all these issues. Yes, precisely. So um, I agree, Dr. Julian, prevention is really key. So um, in fact, we have one question upcoming from our Facebook um, live um, audiences. So this, um, this attendee asked, hi, um, if I smoke, eat unhealthily, am sedentary, when do I have to start worrying about heart issues? Uh, I think tomorrow you better call me. Yeah, so I think if you know that you are leading an unhealthy lifestyle, uh, and especially if you have a family history of heart disease, I think uh, earlier to get it screened early, and earlier to lead a healthy lifestyle than, than later. Yeah, the youngest heart attack patient that I've seen in my practice is 21 years old. So don't think that it, uh, heart disease, heart attacks are for the elderly. We are seeing younger and younger patients. Um, you read off in the newspapers of all these unfortunate, supposedly fit gentlemen run, running down East Coast Parkway, suddenly collapsing and dying. Uh, yeah, a colleague of mine, a young surgeon who recently passed away about two years ago. Similarly, so you have to be uh, do proper heart health screen to make sure things can never be too sure unless you you go for the proper checks. 
Mm, thank you, Dr. Julia. It's really like a, a wake up call to all of us young people out there that um, we don't shouldn't think that only um, the older generation is predisposed to such health heart conditions. In fact, younger the younger you are, you may also uh, be exposed or be um, have the risk of such heart conditions. So um, I guess a lot of um, uh, people may think that. Um, food that are, have higher in good fats is healthier. So this question from this anonymous attendee, is it recommended to consume more foods that are higher in good fat? Does it help fight against the bad fat that I eat? Yeah. So again, it, it backs down to the same theme that I'm trying to share of moderation. Uh, I think in, in, uh, in living in, in, in on our world today is kind of difficult to you know know what's good, what's bad, what good good food, bad food. I think sometimes it gets a bit confusing. I think it's easier if we all just enjoy our life, enjoy all the foods that we want, but then take them in small, moderate amounts. You can enjoy life at the same time you are sensible, you're responsible in your eating. So I think uh, rather than being uh, caught up in, you know, what kind of foods I should avoid or what kinds of food I should take more. Take everything, but take in more small, moderate amounts. Quit your cigarettes. Uh, do regular exercise. See your doctor regularly, especially men number 40, women number 50. Keep everything in check. I think that's the way to go. Mm, okay, so really is back like to the point that everything in moderation. So um, next up, we have a question from Chantel. So Chantel's mother has coronary artery disease. So um, the doctor provided two options, bypass and stenting. So Chantel would like to ask, is bypass better? Like it resolves more clots at one go? Yeah. So let me explain again, what's the difference between uh, 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 open heart bypass surgery versus coronary stenting, which is what I do. Which, which is what I alluded to, putting in the stands and opening up from the inside. Putting in the stands doesn't involve opening up your heart, uh, opening up the chest wall. Uh, the patient is, like I mentioned, the patient is awake. Everything is done uh, minimally invasive. There is no general anesthesia and all that. But open heart surgery is where they will actually split open the chest wall. You need to be on general anesthesia, completely knocked out. Your heart has to be stopped and connected to an external heart-lung machine uh, so that they can take a useless vein from your leg and then bypass the blockage. So basically, that's what it means by bypass. The blockages in the arteries are left as it is. There's no removal of any clots or any plug. What a bypass surgery is, is they, pl they, plant, they use a, a, a useless vein as a conduit to put on one end at the top and one end at the bottom so that the blood will flow bypassing the blockage. So a bypass surgery does not involve, they leave the blockage alone. Uh, in fact, they just create a different conduit to bypass the blockage. So in that sense, uh, it's a little bit different. So heart stenting doesn't involve bypass, it involves actually going inside the coronary artery in a minimally invasive way to put in a stent or like a scaffold to open up from the inside. Uh, so in that sense, we are sort of removing, or not say removing, like, but pushing aside the plug. Okay, thank you, Dr. Julian. So we do see a lot of good questions coming in, but in the essence of time, we will um, be answering one last question for our live Q&A session tonight. Um, not to worry, um, for those who have other questions that you have asked in our Q&A box, um, we would collate them and we would let um, Dr. Julian Tan answer them and then we would post it on our page. So for this last question by um, Chan Chui Li, uh, why post-PCI need to take um, clopidogrel and aspirin? Yeah. So when we put in the stents, uh, maybe I can show you this. After we put in the stents uh, to open up the blockage, don't forget that this is a metal, or a inert metal, but nevertheless, it's still an exposed metal. So when blood stream, uh, when blood flows against a metal, there's a potential for blood clots to form on the surface of the metal. Yeah, uh, so that's why after PCI, or which is coronary stenting, you need to be on two blood thinners 
clopidogrel and aspirin usually, so that the chance for blood clots to form on the surface of the metal is less. Up to a point in time where your own cells uh, grow over the surface of the stent. When you have your own cells lining the uh, inner surface of the stent, then there's a less exposure of the metal and therefore less clots forming. So you need to be on, uh, uh, on these two blood thins. Okay, thank you, Dr. Julian, for uh, your, question, your answers to all the questions that our attendees have um, submitted. Um, I believe it's an, a fruitful night for all of us. Um, and Dr. Julian has answered all the, uh, most of the questions that our audiences have asked as well. So thank you, everyone, for such an engaging session. I myself have definitely learned a lot of valuable um, information from this um, tonight's webinar. So right before we end, we have one more poll that we would like to launch for your feedback on this event quality and also a very important question at the end. So if you'd like to arrange for a more personalized consultation with Dr. Julian himself. So do input in your um, feedback on the three questions as you see in the poll that pop up now. So as you can, as we all know, there are still many questions that uh, we are unfortunately unable to answer due to the lack of time. But fret not, we'll be collating all these questions, answering them with the help of Dr. Julian and posting it on our website. So do follow our Facebook page to keep yourselves updated. So thank you everyone um, for submitting your um, feedback on the poll. So for the questions we have, which have been answered by Dr. Julian tonight, we'll also be releasing them as videos on Medical Channel Asia's social pages. So if you have not subscribed to them, do so now. Also, do keep a lookout for our post-event email with the summarized learning points of tonight's webinar, together with the links to subscribe to our social channels for more updates. If you'd like to arrange an appointment with Dr. Julian due to have your condition assessed, simply drop him an email or WhatsApp his clinic and he will contact you shortly to arrange. So before we all go, do remember to click on our Medical Channel Asia channels, Facebook, YouTube and Instagram for the latest updates. Thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Julian, so much um, for your valuable input and sharing based on your experience. Um, we believe that um, it's really an in invaluable time that we have with you, the plumber of our heart. So everyone have a good night and we look forward to meeting you on our next Doctor On Call series. Bye-bye. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.